Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is characterised by severe levels of inattention, hyperactivity and or impulsivity. In order to meet criteria for the disorder, the symptoms need to be present in two or more settings, so they need to be observable by teachers and by parents. The symptoms also need to be present for at least six months and need to occur before the age of 12. The most important thing about diagnosing ADHD is that the symptoms need to be interfering with day-to-day -day life. So they need to be making school functioning harder for children um, or they might you know, have an impact on social functioning. In terms of inattention, um, really finding it difficult to, to keep your attention um, during a task. And we see this a lot when it's particularly a task that might be a little bit more boring, like schoolwork, for example, where you have to attend um, and stay focused on a particular task. So that might also mean that children might have difficulty completing tasks because they lose track um, and focus. It might mean that they find it harder to pay attention to, to smaller details in their work um, and so on. And with impulse I guess um, this is really about doing things without thinking. Um, so doing the first thing that pops into your mind, uh, for example, um, it can involve you know, blurting out answers in the classroom without waiting your turn, um, interrupting others during conversations and so on. There's no one cause for ADHD. Uh, what we do know though is that ADHD is highly heritable and what that means is that if you have a parent that has ADHD or had symptoms of ADHD during their own childhood, you're more likely to have ADHD. There are a number of studies looking at the genetics of ADHD and so far no one gene has been identified but it seems that there are a number of different genes which interact together to produce the outcome of ADHD but they also interact with environmental factors. And there is a body of research looking at different environmental factors and have found that things like exposure to toxins during pregnancy, like cigarette smoking, for example, can increase risk, as well as pregnancy and birth complications like prematurity and low birth weight. ADHD affects about 5% of children and adolescents worldwide and seems to, and that um, rate seems to be consistent in Western and non-Western countries. So we see very similar um, prevalence estimates when we look across the world. Uh, boys are much more likely to have ADHD at a rate of about three boys to one girl. The best evidence that we have to date is that a combination of medication and behavioural interventions works best to manage ADHD. However, if a child is presenting with more mild ADHD symptoms, behavioural strategies could be tried first and then medication could be considered later. And in terms of behavioural interventions, I guess the, the main types of interventions are those around kind of parent behaviour management training. And it's important to note that parenting does not cause ADHD, um, but it just makes parenting much harder when you're dealing with those symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. So the behavioural strategies are around helping parents to, to build up their toolkit, I guess, to manage those difficult behaviours. And we use a really similar approach with teachers, helping them to manage the behaviours in the classroom and also helping them to adapt the classroom environment to best meet the needs of children with ADHD. So in the classroom environment, um, really seating the child in a place um, that's conducive to learning. Um, so we try to make sure that children with ADHD are seated at the front of the classroom um, where the teacher can, play, can pay close attention to them. Um, also seating them away from distractions, so not sitting next to the bin, for example, or next to the doorway um, is another way of helping them to attend. Um, other ways are giving children really short um, one-step instructions so they can follow through on what you're saying. Um, so being really short, sharp and clear with instructions. Um, consistency, um, so sending really consistent mes messages in terms of what behaviours are appropriate and what behaviours are not. With parents, we, we give them strategies to help them to consistently manage the child's behaviour at home um, and we help them to, to give lots of reinforcement and praise to, to behaviours that are positive in the, in the home environment and also help them to, to give consequences to behaviours that, that may not be ideal. Um, but what we talk about are logical consequences, so not extreme consequences for behaviours, but just small um, consequences so children can learn which behaviours are appropriate and which behaviours are not. 
Um, as part of the management plan, it's really important that um, parents and clinicians are aware of the other difficulties that are going along with ADHD. So about 70% of children who have ADHD will have one or more additional difficulties. Um, so just one example is additional sleep problems that might go along with that. So part of the management plan might also be to, to give specific recommendations for those other areas of functioning. Um, and we found that if you do that, you can get flow on benefits to broader functional outcomes for children with ADHD. Our research really is about trying to understand what factors make a difference to outcomes for children with ADHD and two factors that we've identified are sleep problems and anxiety problems and we've found that they're both really common in ADHD and they they contribute to much poorer outcomes for children with ADHD over time. So just to give the example of sleep problems for example we've developed a two session behavioural intervention that's designed to target the kinds of sleep problems that children with ADHD experience and and we've found that from that two session intervention, that if a child's sleep problems are managed, we can not only improve sleep, but we can see broader improvements in terms of ADHD symptom severity, quality of life, daily functioning. We even see improved working memory skills. And we're doing a very similar uh, trial at the moment focus in, focused on anxiety. Our study in that area is much more preliminary, but again, we're finding improvements in ADHD symptoms too, in addition to anxiety. And we're in, in, in the process at the moment of replicating those findings in a big, um, big trial. So in terms of strategies for sleep, um, the sleep problems that children with ADHD experience are very varied. <laughs> um, so there's many different types of sleep problems that can be experienced. Um, one of the, the sleep problems that we've found that is quite common um, is anxiety at night time. Um, and that seems to be elevated in this population. And, and part of that is needing a parent in the bedroom to fall asleep at night. So to manage that, we use two different strategies. One strategy is called camping out, where we have the parent next to the child to fall asleep to go to bed and then they slowly move themselves out of the bedroom um, at a pace that the child's comfortable with to help them build skills and bravery in coping with their parent being out of the room. The other one is something we call the checking method. Um, so this is where the parent does remove themselves from the room at the outset, but they check on their child at frequent intervals to promote security and let the children know that they're safe. So the checking might start at one minute intervals, so it's quite intense to start off with, but then we find that over the next couple of nights, we can reduce the, the checking to two minutes three minutes, four minutes and so on. And we find that strategy really helps to settle children, helps them to fall asleep earlier um, and helps them to have a sense of achievement because they've um, been really brave and been able to sleep by themselves. An approach for managing anxiety in children with ADHD, um, really it's similar to what we do with children in the general population. So one of the, the strategies we use is something called a stepladder approach, um, where we identify a particular area that the child's finding to be anxiety provoking. Um, so for example, going to school, um, there are some children that refuse to go to school because they're so anxious. So we use a stepladder approach where we start off with a very small, um, small behavior that the child can do to gain confidence then we increase that in complexity and we move up the ladder until we get the child back to school. And we pair each step in the ladder with a, a reward for the child. Um, and with the rewards, they're non-monetary <laughs> rewards, they're, they're usually family-based activities that the child can do with their parent. Um, and it's really a way of, of saying the child's done a great job and has been brave. So we use those kinds of techniques to help children to, to not miss out on the things that anxiety might be stopping them from doing.